And let's try again, even though I have no idea what hit me. Oh, okay. I thought there was gonna be a cutscene, but no. Maybe I can just take one of them out. Not again! Why does this always happen to me? Why do my arrows go right through him? explode okay are we done oh no jeez uh oh you can see them they can't Whoa. see you Ugh. Come on. <sighs> That's the last of them. All right. Eight not structural failure. Repeat. <sighs> or not? Huh? What? Help me, brothers. <gasps> Come on. Room's clear. For a moment, anyway. Get moving. You have to find Gaia. I'll try. No. No. It's not like I need any of this anyway. But I'm a hoarder. Never know when I might need these. Right. I agree. So this is Gaia? Huh. Hello, I'm Margot Shen, and this is Hephaestus. As the name might tip you off, this is going to be the subordinate function that Gaia will use to make lots and lots of robots. Her personal forge. Except, it's not that simple. Um, so like, you probably noticed that only about a third of you are robotics engineers. The rest, experts in machine cognition, virtual heuristics, that stuff. Well, that's because we aren't going to be the ones designing and building robots. The last thing we want is to burden Gaia with a bunch of outmoded 21st century designs. Waste of time. Our purpose is to empower Gaia to build the robots. And not just build, imagine, from scratch. 
any robot she needs for any conceivable purpose, designed and fabricated at a snap of a finger. Hers. Her finger. So, Hephaestus isn't really the forge. It's more like the knowledge of craft and ingenuity of a master smith to wield the hammer. Encoded as software. Virtual creativity made real. Gaia's already learning. In simulation, she's doing some very creative things with fractal assembly and animal morphologies. Her designs aren't about to win the Liam Prize anytime soon, but hey, everyone has to start somewhere. So, yes, time to get started. Let's do this. I don't get it. Which part? It's a little technical at places. If Gaia was designed to save life, why would the robots it makes attack people? Perhaps it loves some forms of life more than others. Hmm. The derangement. The machines weren't always so angry. True. Mostly they were docile until 10, 15 years ago. For years, Hephaestus has been forcing cauldrons to make aggressive machines. I've seen it myself, in the cauldrons. Stalkers, ravagers, the Thunderjaw. How could it do that? And why? Why indeed. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. Like the crazy dude with uh, that drank the machine oil. He dreamt that the Thunderjaw was created to fight off humans. And hunters. I've seen these shapes before. In cauldrons. But of course. The birthing places of Gaia's machines. Probably because humans started hunting these machines for scraps so they could uh, you know build buildings or clothes or whatever and that's probably why I don't know is this the same thing again hello I'm Margot Shen and yeah. this is Hephaestus as the name might tip you off this is going to be the subordinate function that Guy will use to make lots and lots of robots her personal forge except Wow, you weren't kidding about Gaia's predilection for animal morphologies. Sure, not totally unexpected, given the rough natural terrain her bots will have to navigate, but I agree that there is something deeper going on here. Her designs aren't just functional. They feel almost like, well, tributes is the word that comes to mind. As though she's already mourning their loss. And not just for the disappearing fauna of our time, but creatures from the fossil record too. References to megafauna and some her, of her designs so cool. Well, whatever Gaia thinks up, her faces will empower her to build it. I just wish we could still be around in a century or two to see what she makes, Margo. Well, she made it's something. Not that simple. Um, so like, you probably noticed that only about a third of you are robotics engineers. The rest, experts in machine cognition, virtual heuristics, that stuff. And I'm pretty sure now that all mother, whatever she was, was probably Gaia. Or that's what they're referring to, the Nora. But what happened with Hades? What went wrong there? Got corrupted by Fargo machines or something. This is it. Elizabeth Sobeck's office. But it, it's sealed oh. off. There's got to be a way inside. Keep looking. More eclipse. Oh, geez. Careful now. Are there more? No. Oh, 
What was that sound? Welcome to a ah. the collective memory of the human species and the wellspring of knowledge for future generations. I am Samina Elbaji. Until recently, I was director of the International Collective Memory Institute in New Tehran. As a heritage professional, I devoted my career to the preservation of human knowledge, creative endeavor, and cultural achievement. Apollo is, therefore, the ultimate embodiment of a lifelong passion, albeit under the very worst circumstances imaginable. The challenges before us are immense. Specifically, we will have to design and implement four major initiatives simultaneously. First, the construction of data repositories in cradle facilities around the world ensuring redundancy. Second, the collection and processing of a projected 180 million discrete data entries. 42 zettabytes of data in Mandarin, English, Spanish and Arabic. Third, the transferal and encoding of all that data onto DNA encapsulated in synthetic fossils. The only medium capacious and durable enough to safeguard it without degradation for the centuries to come. And last, but not least, the development of the holographic interface and gamified curricula, by which future humans will commune with Apollo, progressively unlocking heuristic learning modules Leveling up their knowledge and skills they will need to take control of the terraforming system. That is the future towards which all of our efforts will be directed. Not just the preservation of the past, but the seed for the flourishing of a new tree of knowledge. Welcome, and let us begin. Huh. Well, something went wrong there. No one ever got to access Apollo. Over the past 10 years, I've performed an exhaustive review of data storage solutions, magnetic, optical, quantum, even that eternity tech that FAS was shilling a year or so ago. But every other solution has one or more fatal shortcomings, too heavy to transport, too massive to install in the allotted space, too power intensive over the centuries, too prone to failure past 300 to 400 years, etc. Encapsulated DNA will easily hold the 40 plus zettabytes we're projecting for Apollo. There are still many details to finalize, of course. To start with, we need to select the inert material in which we'll embed the molecules, already testing 16 candidate materials, as well as design and fabricate the power systems and sealed reliquaries that will keep the DNA at minus 18 degrees Celsius for 1,000 plus years. So as long as I assure you that I didn't factor into my decision, may I confess that I deem it entirely fitting, indeed propitious, that we will be using the very building blocks of life to preserve human knowledge from mechanized extinction. It's not just ironic, but heroic. Life as the hero, beating back the forces of oblivion. In any case, much to do. Until next time, peace be with you, Samina. Maybe the Eclipse got to access Apollo. I don't know. Uh, I guess I'll have to take these out now. Over the past two months, the full benefit of our procurement of a copy of the Homer archive from far zenith has made itself known and as a result all of apollo apollo's keys deliverables are on schedule apollo has already surpassed 40 million discrete data entries and continues to grow the physical science modules are effectively complete the soft science modules close behind world history cultural data and media archives are also on schedule language preservation is wrapping up a bit ahead of schedule due to falling short of our goal to preserve 4500 languages <laughs> 
I suppose the tragic early loss of Papua New, New Guinea doomed that goal from the outset, with attendant curricula development about to begin. Speaking of the heuristic curricula, they are performing well in testing, with children and adolescents demonstrating high levels of engagement with and trust in the Aristotle and Aspasia personae. Person personally, I find them highly engaging, especially when they debate. I wish half my professors had been so entertaining. Peace be with you, Samina. I'm imagining a school, like an Apollo school right now. I'm reading, what's it called, Ready Player One right now, where they can go to school online. I imagine it to be kind of like that. Oh, there's more. Well, All tag him. This lost. The ancient's greatest gift to us. Greatest? How about the fact we exist at all? To abide in ignorance is a curse, Aloy. You of all people should know that. Oh no, I'm gonna mess this up, I know. Let's do this. Oh jeez. Now he still sees me. That's the last of him. Alone once more. <laughs> he made a weird what sound. Been a cave of wonders. Yeah, I want to have a look around first. Dr. Sobek, please archive this testimonial in Apollo. Cross-reference to all mentions of my name and Operation Enduring Victory. My name is General Aaron Harris. From 2060 to 2066, I served as the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the highest ranked officer of the- Oh, why does that happen? No, that wasn't it, right? This one? Dr. Sobek, please archive this testimonial in Apollo. Cross-reference to all mentions of my name and Operation Enduring Victory. My name is General Aaron Harris. From 2060 to 2066, I served as the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, 
the highest ranked officer of the United States Armed Forces. The tenure of my command included strategic planning and oversight of Operation Enduring Victory, a falsehood perpetrated on the civilian populations of the United States and other nations during the last 14 months of life on this planet. Before the Pharaoh Plague, I did my job and did it well. I was bold and decisive, crafty in political maneuvers. It wasn't an accident that I rose to my position and became the commander of the largest mechanized force ever assembled. But to what end? My only lasting achievement was the extinction of life on Earth. And my one redeeming act, if any, was to delay that extinction by days or weeks, by throwing more death at it. It is my hope that there will be no need for men like me in the world to come. If you are one of the people of that future world listening to this message, please know that I am sorry and that I wish you well. Sincerely, Aaron Harris. Oh, making me tear up. He talked about that testimonial before. Welcome to Apollo, the collective memory of the human species and the wellspring of knowledge for future oh. generations. Yeah, no, not again. I think I'm done here now. Right? I think so. Well. Well, what does that sound though? I thought it was coming from these red things here, but no. No. Don't want to miss anything. Welcome huh? to Hades. Zero Dawn's extinction failsafe protocol. The ultimate killer app. Now, I know what you're thinking. The purpose of Gaia is to resurrect life. So why give her a subordinate function, only purpose of which is to wipe out life all over again? I mean, what the... what? Just plumb crazy, ain't it? Well... No, it isn't. Reconstituting a biosphere? That's a tall order. Tech smart as Gaia may be, odds are she won't get it right the first time. I mean, imagine you're Gaia 200 years from now and this new biosphere growing, it's all gone wrong. Alkalines are skyrocketing, coniferous forests eroding under the lash of superstorms that would have drowned Noah. It's chaos, spinning top that won't stop wobbling. What are you going to do? Release phase one organisms into that hot mess? Hope their CO2 and methane can balance out what you got started? Hell no. What you're going to do, Gaia, is step aside while Hades takes over and does what you're just too darn nurturing and life-loving to do. Which is burn that misbegotten mess of a biosphere to the ground so Gaia can start over. Okay, not burn, more like... Reverse terraforming operations and suffocate it. But you get the idea. Hades takes the biosphere back to zero. Square one, blank slate. And then, only then, does it hand the steering wheel back to Gaia and say, Try again, old girl. And better this time, or we'll have to do this again. That's Hades. It's pretty badass when you think about it. Extinction on demand. Death on speed dial. All for
for the greater good, of course, but still, kind of metal. So welcome to Hades. Welcome to the Void. Okay, so if that's the original purpose of Hades, why does it want me extinct? We need more data. And how does it end up in the wreckage of a Pharaoh Titan, getting worshipped by the Eclipse like some kind of god? I'm learning as you are, Aloy. Keep searching. Well, maybe this isn't the world that Gaia envisioned. And that's why Hades is active. Trying to take it down again. Color me confounded, Lizzie. Bashkor? Anyone who says the old TT codes to Bashkor is straight up lying, and you know it. Old Trav don't have no truck with commercialized razzle dazz. Nuh uh. Heck, I'd rather guzzle a li liter of citrum runoff than listen to Grace Worm for 30 seconds. <clears throat> Hand to God and swear in my mama's grave and she was religious. Nah, that ain't Bashkor blasting the Hades lap, shaking the walls, rattling folks' teeth. It's death metal, girl. Classical music, 80s and 90s mostly. Got me some Dutch deathcore, some Japanese gore grind, some Swedish cannibal themed stuff too. Step by if you want to listen. Or heck, just come within 50 meters of the lab. Ain't no bashcore, you'll see. Or here, rather, in the screech that rents the air. And feel, and the throbbing pulse of the floor and the walls and ceiling swallowing you up like you was Jonah trapped in the gullet of a gothic deathfish. Hallelujah. As for those requests to turn it down, no can do, Lizzie. This is how I code. Turn down my death metal, might as well give up stimulants, chocolate malts, and industrial accident bids. Last I heard, we was supposed to be coding Hades down here. I am really supposed to code an extinction protocol without death metal to inspire me? Nuh uh. I don't think so. Stay cool. Hmm. Tate here. Just popped three blues, but I earned it. Finally figured out a Goldilocks solution to Gaia's rather extreme executive authority. If that ain't worth 10 to 12 hours of dream time, what is? Before this, every usurpation protocol I designed failed in simula simulation because it was either too hard or too soft. Too hard and it degraded the Gaia core. Sure, it pried her figurative fingers off the figurative driving wheel so Hades could take control, but by breaking her fingers, sometimes her arms too, so that couldn't fly. Everything depends on Gaia taking control back after Hades has done its business, so had to find a solution that didn't leave Gaia any worse for the wear. Too soft, and Gaia only pretended to relinquish control. In simulation after simulation, Hades would take command of the terraforming system and reverse operations, only to have Gaia lurk in the background, quietly reversing processes and falsifying telemetry to hide its interference. Sneaky. I swear, ain't nothing Gaia won't do to keep life going even when it's just simulated plant life. Turns out the just right solution is to isolate Gaia in a protective cold shell, preserving its integrity, then unseat it from command position so Hades can slip into the figurative captain's chair and work its magic. Um, those blues are coming on strong now, so I'm not really describing it so clear, but pretty sure it'll work. Yeah, those blues are pretty strong. Guess it's time to sleep in bed. I'll be back to it tomorrow, alligators. Okay, so my wild guess is that Gaia is still isolated somewhere. I'm having a lot of wild guesses here. I hope you appreciate them. Mr. Tay, this may be your 666 submission in just five days, and oh, what a doozy. Despite earlier warnings, uh, uh, concerning inappropriate materials, you chose to submit 265 holographic remasters of acknowledged classics of extreme exploitation cinema. Allow me then to thank you on two counts. One, for giving me the pleasure of rejecting your submission, thereby consigning your favorite Eastern European torture flakes and their ilk to the dust heap of oblivion. It truly warms my heart to know that I have saved future humanity from the ordeal of experiencing not just one, but all 16 installments of Making a Millipede. Don't worry, the Pasolini material has already been preserved. Extreme, perhaps, but art. Two, for clarifying a concept that has so long been ambiguous and ethically fraught for arch archivists such as myself, the definition of obscenity. 
You have freed me from the subjective, subjective quagmire embodied in Judge Potter's famous utterance. I know it when I see it. Thanks to you, I can now apply a single objective criterion. If Travis Tate submitted it, it's obscene. Accordingly, I have directed a polo staff to summar summarily reject all of your future submissions sight unseen. Perhaps you might invest the time you would have spent preparing further submissions on, oh, I don't know, your assigned work? We have a world to save after all. Or the rest of us do, anyway. Okay, now I wonder if this Travis guy has anything to do with Apollo not working. Did I miss anything? What's that? Oh, that's the Hades one, okay. No, I guess I didn't miss anything. Looks like the only way onwards. Welcome to Eleuthia, the crown and king of Gaia's subordinate functions. For it is by Eleuthia that the human race will continue to exist. I am Patrick Brochard Klein, the Alpha in charge of this program. Now let one thing be perfectly clear from the outset. Eleuthia is not a genetic engineering project. Our goal is to preserve the human genome, not alter it. A snapshot of human genetic diversity, literally frozen in time. The genetic quintessence of our species, unmodified. Under my watch, our activities and initiatives will comply with the 2034 clone provisions and the 2048 rally accords. Now that may seem a quaint, even trivial concern to you in light of present circumstances. But, as one of the authors of the Accords, it is far from trivial to me. The practical challenges before us are staggering in scope and complexity, but not insurmountable. No. Global collation and provisional storage of zygotes, perfection of exogenic technologies, design and perfection of servitors to provide nurture and inculcation during early child development, all of these program components must and will proceed in tandem. To say nothing of the breakneck construction of cradle facilities at sites around the world. So... Si vous êtes prêt, let us begin. In summary, that's where they made babies, right? Yeah. Um, I'm gonna make another cut here. The God, I think this whole thing will probably be four episodes long, but yeah, we'll see.